This series is called Idol Factory. Obviously, it has to do with idolatry. But before we dive in, we need to talk about something really important, which is meatloaf. We need to talk about meatloaf, okay? Which might just be the most underrated food in the entirety of the whole wide world. Yeah, <laughs> someone's already like, amen. I see that head bother. Someone's like, yes, I agree with that. Let me tell you a quick story. So a mother and her adult daughter were in the kitchen and they were making meatloaf together. And the adult daughter, before she finishes up the meatloaf, she grabs it, she cuts the ends off the meatloaf, puts it in the pan and puts it in the oven. She thinks, mom, why do we, why do, we do that? You know, I only cut off the ends of the meatloaf before I put it in the pan and put it in the oven because I always saw you do that. And she says, well, I don't really know. I just did it because that's what my mother did. And so they said, well, let's call grandma. So they call grandma. Grandma, why did you always cut off the ends of the meatloaf before you put it in the pan and put it into the oven? And she says, well, the meatloaf was always just too big for the pan. (laughs) So I cut off the ends, I put it in the pan and put it in the oven. I tell you all that to say that if we don't think about how we live our lives, we will do things that do not make sense because we're just not thinking about it. In fact, we tend to live our lives on autopilot quite a bit. And autopilot can be a problem because this series is really based off a quote from John Calvin where he says this, the human heart is an idle factory. Every one of us from our mother's womb is an expert in inventing idols. So feel good. You are an expert at something, okay? If someone says you're not knowledgeable, you're an expert at inventing idols, Your heart is a little idle factory. Now, it's always important to define our terms, okay? Because things might be getting a little muddy right now. So I want to be really clear. Worship is what we're talking about here. When we're talking about idolatry, we're in the category of worship. And this is a definition of worship that I particularly enjoy. Worship is the extravagant admiration or devotion to something. That is worship. Wow. And in the Christian context, when we're talking about idolatry, what we're talking about is something that we're worshiping other than God. All right. So we are experts at using our lives to extravagantly devote ourselves and admire things other than God. In fact, it's kind of the gist of this verse from 1 John 5, 21, where it says, Dear children, keep away from anything that might take God's place in your heart. It's so easy for us to replace God at the center of our lives and replace it with other things, and we would call that idolatry. You're an expert in it, and I'm an expert in it. So before we continue, let's just remove the stigma from the room, shall we? Who has a problem with idolatry here today? You're not raising your hand. You're in danger of it. Okay, let's try it again. We almost did it. We got like 80% participation. Who here has a problem with idolatry? Right, we, we all do. We all do. I think John Calvin is right. It's so easy for us to revolve our lives around many other things other than God. To extravagantly admire or be devoted to things other than God. So what we're going to do in kind of the first half of this morning is we're going to look at six case studies of idolatry. This is the fun part. Students, some of you know these, okay? Don't be that person who yells out the answer because you know it. Let the adults play the game, okay? Let them have fun. So if you know it, just sit back, let mom and dad have a shot. It'll be fun. I'm going to read a verse and you're going to try to identify what that person has as an idol in their life from that passage. Okay, here's the clue. They all start with the letter P because every good sermon needs alliteration, right? They all start with the letter P. There's six of them. Here's the first verse from Matthew 10, 37. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. This is Jesus speaking. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. What would be the idol in that context? Starts with a P. Puppies is not right. Thank you for playing. Any... Again, if you know it, if you know it, because you've heard this before, let someone else jump in. Anyone? Parents, Parents, close, but that, you know, you're not the, there also says sons and daughters, so you're on the right track. People, People, that's right. Case study number one, people. Okay, that's, that's like the obvious idol, I find. Like how obvious is it, especially if you're a student, if you're in junior high or high school, that is you. It is so easy for your life to revolve around people, to revolve around your friends, pretty much. You're trying to, de- you're desperately trying to detach yourself from your parents, and you're finding someone else to, it's not a spouse quite yet, because that freaks you out, um, but we're going, and then our friends, that's who we're living our lives for. Or maybe it's your spouse, or maybe it is your children, and you're the parent. I don't know what it is, but it is so easy for us to live with our extravagant devotion and admiration being towards people in our lives 
rather than God. So that's the first one, okay? People. Let's look at the second one. It's a passage, Matthew 16, 22 to 23. Here's the context, because context is always important. Jesus basically tells uh, Peter that he's going to go die on the cross. And Peter, before that, had just like nailed the quiz. And he, he identified Jesus as the Messiah, which was good news for him. You know, he really crushed it. Jesus says, I'm going to the cross. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. What's the idol? Pride? Oh, I like it. I like it. I mean, these are, these are malleable, but that's not the one I'm looking for right now. Jesus has a path that he's on. Path is not the idol. But, but Peter has another... What? Plan. I'm hearing it. Awesome. Peter has another plan, right? Isn't it incredible? He's like, God, (laughs) I love this verse because Jesus is like, I have this plan to save all of humanity. And Peter's like, no, no, no. This is about me. This is about the position that I will have in your kingdom, Jesus. I have other plans. Okay. Hey, let's be honest. How easy is it for us to live our lives with our most extravagant devotion being to the plans that we have for us. Let's be honest. It's pretty tempting. We're experts in it. We're idle factories. Okay, let's look at the third one. Matthew 19, 21 and 22. The context, again, is that a rich young ruler comes to Jesus and he's got the perfect question. He's asking the right question to the right person. How do I inherit eternal life? Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. What's the idol? Possessions. It's right in there. That one's an easy one. Okay. What I want to point out and what is so amazing about this passage is that Jesus is saying, follow me. Sound familiar? That's what he says when he calls his disciples, the exact same word, akolutheo. He's literally inviting him into a discipleship relationship, but he can't do it. He is literally rejecting relationship with God because he's more attached to his possessions. He is unable to give those up. If ever there was exchanging relationship with God for an idol, I think this is a great picture of it, okay? So we've got people plans, possessions. Let's look at the next one in Luke 15, 11 through 13. Jesus is telling a story. Jesus continues, there was a man who had two sons, and this man represents God. The younger one said to the father, father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth on wild living. What's the idol? (laughs) Parties. I love it when people say that. Parties. We all like a good party, don't we? Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. I would say pleasure, right? Amongst many other things. And what's amazing about this parable is, again, it is is this beautiful. It's actually tragic, but beautiful in reconciliation. The story of how this son is willing to reject relationship with his father, reject the character of the story who symbolizes God, because he'd rather go off into wild living. He'd rather go off and pursue pleasure. So we have people, plans, possessions, and pleasure. And then this last one, we're going to hit two at once. We're going to round off five and six. And rather than a negative example, I think this is actually an incredibly positive example of someone who is not indulging in idolatry, okay? And it's about John the Baptist. And here's the context. John, Jesus is getting really popular and people are starting to forget about you. I'm freaking out. Are you freaking out, John? To this, John replied, A person can receive only what is given to them from heaven. You yourself can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but I'm sent ahead of him. He must become greater. I must become less. What could have been the idol? Power is one. Sorry. Popularity is very close. I chose another word. Yes. Prestige. Okay. So let's look at all those together. People. Plans, possessions, pleasure, power, and prestige. Now, for the sake of learning, because I love good learning, are we willing to say it all together? Because what I want to do is I want you to go away from here 
And maybe at other points in your life, go, are there idols in my life? And to have a schematic. I don't think that these encounter every single idol. There's maybe other little categories we could add. But it's an interesting way to think about it. So let's say these all three times together. Can we do that? People, plans, possessions, pleasure, power, prestige. People, plans, possessions, pleasure, power, prestige. People, plans, possessions, pleasure, power, prestige. These are the things that our hearts tend to gravitate towards, that we tend to be extravagantly devoted to, that we tend to extravagantly admire rather than God. Now, I've got a quick image up here of of how Jesus feels about idolatry. And you're like, come on, Pastor Matt, you got us all to raise our hands. And then you're putting up this picture like Jesus is all mad at us for our idolatry. That's not very fair. Let's jump ahead to the verse there from Matthew 21, 13. Perfect. This is the context. Jesus finds the temple where people are meant to encounter God and enjoy God and vice versa. Where God is meant to encounter us and enjoy us. Where that beautiful relationship is meant to take place. But when he arrives, that relationship, what the temple was meant for, is being destroyed. And he said to them, it's written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. But you make it a den of robbers. It's pretty intense, right? Those are some pretty intense words from Jesus. Where he sees something that's meant to be a place of beautiful relationship between God and humanity, and it's being destroyed. Can I help us reframe maybe the way that we see this encounter of Jesus? When I was a kid, honestly, this was the one moment where I was like, how can Jesus be without sin? Like, you know, like Jesus is sinless. That's That's what the Bible teaches so clearly. And yet, when he gets to the temple, he's mad enough that he takes time to braid a whip And then he is driving people out. I'm like, how is this possible? How is this the sinless Jesus? Okay, now I don't think Jesus is sinning here. That's kind of a side issue. I don't think he is. But have you ever seen something beautiful being destroyed needlessly and had anger rise up within you? Yeah. Can I give one? I watched Monuments Men a few nights ago. And it's about how uh, the Nazis destroyed tons of art during the war. Tons of it lost forever. Human achievements of beauty. It destroyed for no reason. I'm watching the movie just getting mad. Why do these beautiful pieces of art need to be destroyed for no reason? I want us to reframe the way we see this because I think Jesus is so passionate about us connecting with God that when he sees something like money getting in the way, it just drives him crazy. Enough that he's willing to take a whip and drive out the money. Get out. You're making this a den of robbers. And this is meant to be a house of prayer for all nations. Is that a bit of a reframing for you? It's less about Jesus being just mad at that individual and full of fury and more going, something beautiful is being destroyed here needlessly. I think we can all resonate with Jesus' passion for us to be connecting in relationship with God. I think this verse... And John 10.10 10 actually gives us a beautiful framework to understand the heart of Jesus. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I come that you may have life and have it to the full. Does that make sense? Jesus is on his mission here to remove the things that will actually destroy us and to have us have life and life to the full. Another translation says life and life abundantly because I think this is the heart of Jesus towards our idols. If we look at those six idols and if we choose to live for those, Jesus knows that we might end up living a life that is full of manipulation and disappointment and greed and dissatisfaction and brutality and emptiness and so much more. Living with those idols at the center of our lives ultimately destroy us. And Jesus can't stand for that because he wants us to have life and life abundantly. Let's hear a little bit from Freddie Mercury, right? So here's Freddie, a man that I think you could say had pretty much all of these idols firmly in place in his life. Not, I'm not judging him saying he was an idolater, but he had people, plans, possessions, pleasure, power, prestige, all that he wanted, okay? And he says this, can you imagine how terrible it is when you've got everything and you're still desperately lonely? That is awful beyond words. 
I'm so powerful on stage that I seem to have created a monster. When I'm performing, I'm an extrovert, yet inside, I'm a completely different man. Do you hear that? Someone who has it all. And is it satisfying his heart? No. And Jesus sees these idols that we are so prone to creating, and he is passionate about helping us remove them. It infuriates him to see our relationship with God breaking and us rather choosing something that is only going to destroy our hearts and destroy who we were meant to be. Genesis 1.27 says, So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. I often encounter people who will live their lives a little bit like this. Yeah, I think God exists. Okay. And they just kind of go on with their lives. And there's not much more to it than that, right? And I think that that doesn't really make sense at all. Because if God exists, nothing could make a greater difference in the lives that we live. In my my apartment, in fact, in my bedroom, I I have my favorite piece of art. um, Which is this painting right here. And yes, let me describe it for you. It's a man climbing on a ladder. And he's painting a mustache on the moon. Okay? It's playful. It's delightful, and I really enjoy it. Um, but, what, but I bought this for my friend Nina May, someone that I actually knew in college. And I want to ask you, if, if we wanted to understand the meaning of this painting, the purpose of it, who would we have to go to? We'd have to go to Nina May, right? That's intuitive. We get that instantly, right? Because she's the creator. She's the artist. And yet, for some reason... People will think, we have a creator, we have an artist... Okay, I'll just go on living my life the way that I should. But but wait, if you want to understand your meaning, understand your purpose, you need to go to your artist. Does that make sense? Nothing could impact your life more than whether you are created by God. And when God talks about the meaning and the purpose that he created you for, in Mark 12, he says this, that he wants you to love God with all of your heart all of your soul, all of your mind, all of your strength. And we could dive into the the nuance of what each of those means, but really what he's trying to say is to love God with all of your being, all of who you are. Your artist made you for a purpose, and that purpose is loving relationship with God. That's really the linchpin of everything I want to tell you this morning. Because let's be honest, the idols are really tempting. And sometimes they look good and I'm standing up here telling you that they'll, they'll destroy your life and maybe you're not there yet or maybe you just don't believe me. But I, I want you to see that you could live for those idols. But in fact, your artist has created you for something greater, a relationship with him that won't destroy you. In fact, I believe that when we have God at the center of our lives, we become more human than we've ever been because that's who we were made to be. So we've run out of time very quickly, but we have another section to run through because I don't want to leave you there. We're going to talk about real quick, three different ways to find freedom from these idols. Cause hopefully you've seen you have idols, but God actually wants something greater for you. And there are three ways to find freedom that I think the first is this, and it's simple. It's to actually ask God for help. How obvious is that? It's kind of like saying, uh, I'm starting a brand new diet. Let's get ice cream, you know, to celebrate my brand new diet. We're like, oh, I got to get rid of idols in my life. The first thing I'm going to do is try really hard in my own strength to get rid of these idols. Whoa, slow down. 1 Corinthians 3, 17 to 18 tells us that now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And so again, we're all at this point. We all raised our hands. I, I believe you. I'm with you, right? We're all at this point where we have idols. And the first step is to actually just go, God, I actually need you to transform my heart. This isn't something I can do on my own. My heart is a little idol factory. Here's the second way that we can find freedom from idols is we can kill the idol. Why do I say that? Well, I get that from Jesus because again, sometimes Jesus says things that are more extreme than I would go, but because I'm his follower, I I have to go with him. Um, He says this, if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Jeez, (laughs) Jesus is intense, right? He's wise and he's loving and he's God, but man, he's intense. Okay, what's the heart of this verse? 
Throw those butter packets up there. A little while ago, I worked at a place, and, uh, and I worked right next to a Tim Hortons. So I would go, and I'd get my chili in my bun quite often. Very good. Yeah, anyone else? Mm, good. It's a good little snack. Yeah. Okay, and they would give me these butter packets, and the butter packets sometimes would sit right on top of the chili. And, uh, and one time, it, like, really melted, like, pure liquid. And as I opened it, whoop, the butter fell, and it landed right on an earbud because I was sitting at my desk. And now I'm sitting there with a problem because I'm like, that is disgusting. That is something I never want to put in my ear. Who's resonating with that? (laughs) That, And I was like, here are my options, right? Like I mark it somehow, but I'm like, one day I'm going to forget and it's going to happen. I'm like, the only real option is that I cut this off right now. That's the only option. That's the only way to ensure that this buttery nastiness never gets into my ear. Can I venture that that's what Jesus is saying? If there are certain television programs or sports teams you can't follow or electronics that you can't have without it becoming an idol, then Jesus is saying, just cut it off. Just cut it off from your life. That's one of our options. It's it's for us to look at something and go, I'm so desperate for this never to become an idol that maybe I'll just remove this from my life for now. I had a student who did that with their phone. They decided that they were going to smash it. And you know what everyone said? You're crazy. You're not allowed to do that. You're taking Jesus too seriously. And I was like, but but you know what? Um, You know, I'm I'm with him. I'm not sure his parents were super thrilled on the whole thing. But he was like, this is an idol in my life. And I would rather remove it than risk it becoming an idol. I think he was understanding Jesus for what Jesus is truly saying. (sighs) Now, in wrapping up, you might understand that, of course, you cannot kill everything. (laughs) Who had that thought immediately when I said, kill your idol, right? Honey, I just love you too much. This is the end. Um, If your idol is school, you have to keep going to school. If you're a workaholic, you you need to keep working. If it's your children, they're your children. If it's your spouse, you understand what I'm saying. In most instances, we don't have the luxury of just simply removing that idol from our life. Sadly, that's where most sermons end. Remove the idols from your life. Be gone, you know? (laughs) And we walk out and we're like, I'm done, (laughs) you know? What do we do from here? Well, there's a third option. And I think the third option is the most difficult option, but I also think it's the option that Jesus most wants for our lives. And it's for us to redeem our idols. Again here, scripture says something that I'm not sure I would say, but I submit to the authority of scripture. The context of 1 Corinthians 10 is that people are eating meat that has been sacrificed to idols. And this is what Paul says. Eat anything sold in the meat market without raising questions of conscience. For the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. So if you came to Pastor Matt, this meat was sacrificed to a demon. Should I eat it? I'm like, uh, it's a very uncomfortable question. But Paul's like, wait a second. Everything that exists is the Lord's. In everything you do, do it for the glory of God. This is what I want you to grasp because this is a problem, okay? None of the idols that we've talked about are bad things. Not a single one of them are an evil or bad thing. Is that clear? That has to be clear. Because otherwise we're going to start we're going to start pulling things out of our lives that God wants to give us good things. God's not calling us to remove these things, but he's asking us to redeem them, to put them in a right order. Unfortunately, this is how we tend to view our idolatry. We tend to do it in in terms of percentages. We tend to do it like this. Uh Oh, I have an idolatry problem. God is only getting 15 percent of my life. But I know that God is supposed to be the most important thing in my life. So I'm going to reconfigure the numbers a little bit. I'm going to move some stuff around. And at the end of the day, if I get God 51%, then God is the most important thing in my life. And I've done a good job. Pat myself on the back. That's how we tend to view idolatry, right? 
We know that God is supposed to be the most important thing in our lives. But this is the problem with having the little side hustle, with having 20% of our affections in our life and our devotion going to possessions or 15% of our heart going towards people is that Matthew 6 says this really clearly. No one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate one and love the other or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You can't serve both God or money. And I, I just encourage you to replace that with any idol. You can't serve both God and people. You can't serve both God and possessions. You can't serve both God and pleasure. Does that make sense? You can't really do it. The percentage game doesn't really work. And this is the pinnacle of really what I'm trying to tell you this morning. Is that I think God has a different way of having us think about what it looks like to live for him. Where God is at the center of our lives and people and plans and possessions, pleasure, power, prestige, all beautiful things, wonderful things that God has created not to destroy us, but to bless us need to be done in such a way that is glorifying God. Does that make sense? It's a different way of thinking. And I think the way that it plays out is whether I'm at church or whether I'm at school or on the bus or sitting at the table with my family, can I ask myself as I interact with people and my plans and my possessions and pleasure and power prestige, can I continually ask myself, how do I do this in a way that glorifies God? I think that's the heart of destroying the idol factory. Because none of these things are bad things, but they're all things that can distract us from God. In fact, God gave us all those things. And just like the meat that was used for idolatry but can be used for worship, all these things in our lives, which can be idolatrous, can be used for worship. When we live a life that asks, how do we do all these things in a way that glorifies God? This is the heart of it. John 10.10 10 tells us that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and life abundantly. It is so hard to trust Jesus with people, plans, possessions, pleasure, power, and prestige. Isn't it? I believe that we will only be able to live with God at the center asking how do we do all these things in a way that glorifies God, when we trust the heart of Jesus is to give us life and life abundantly, that he has plans and wonderful things for us when it comes to people, plans, possessions, pleasure, power, and prestige. But that grows out of a deep trust in who Jesus really is, that he has better plans for your life than you have for your life. I know it is hard to believe. I find it hard to believe too. But Jesus has better plans for your life than you have for your life. Can you trust him? And are you willing to walk in such a way that you're always asking, how do I do this in a way that glorifies God?